once you fall out of that zone where there's not enough endemic margin in your pricing to support yourself plus your partners, then stop selling to your partners. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the indirect relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Larry Walsh, and here are three things you want to know about Larry before we start. He is the CEO and Chief Analyst at Channelnomics. We're going to learn a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, he and I were on a joint webinar with Model N, and I was blown away with his intelligence and how it applies to channels. So this is just going to be a fascinating conversation. And he started his career as a writer slash editor, and somehow he became this brilliant channel guy. Welcome, Larry. You know, thank, you know, I like the way you position that. Somehow I became this brilliant channel guy. It's necessity. You know that most writers and editors don't make any money. So uh, ab there's absolutely. That's why that's why you went into it in the first place, because you wanted to be poor. Yeah. You know, as we used to say in my newspaper days, the competition was so high because the stakes were so low. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. So how did you make the transition? I, normally I ask how you got into pricing, but since you're not a pricing guy per se, how did you get into channels? What happened? Storytelling. I mean, look, it, it's selling. Look, it, it's and look, and this is what I have to say about when people ask me about what I do and nobody understands it. Uh, because nobody really understands what a channel is. And I was like, well, here in COVID times, it's very easy. Do you buy toilet paper from Georgia Pacific? No, you buy it from a supermarket or some other retail store that gets it from a distributor, that gets it from some logistics company, that gets it from the manufacturer, that then source some raw material to make it. Um, you know, so there's an entire chain of which materials flow before they get to you. And that is a channel. And I got into this. It was really a, a you know different route for me. I was still an editor. I was the editor of a magazine called Bar Business, which specialized in technology channels. And uh, I I was a security guy before that. I was a guy who was doing internet and information security. And uh, I found this channel thing, and I was like, going, I had no idea what it was, and it's absolutely fascinating and completely underappreciated. So it's kind of interesting because when you said the word channel and described it, it's not the way I think of a channel. So let's let's talk about this just for a second. Mm -hmm. I think what you described was more of a supply chain, right? If, so if I want to build a computer, I've got to buy a bunch of parts and those parts come from sand somewhere that was dug up off a beach someplace. And, right? and so there's this whole supply chain to get sand into my computer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet when I think of a channel, I think of it as, there was a semiconductor manufacturer. They built a part. They sold it through a distributor who had a salesperson who called on a customer, Intel, who bought the product. So where, where's my disconnect? Well, look, I think you have to, when I think about channels, this is what I'm thinking about is selling relationships. How do we get product into the hand of whoever the consumer happens to be? Now, let's just take your example. Does, you know, silicon... Get, you know, how does SAM become silicon that becomes a chip that gets into a computer that gets to where we are today recording a podcast? Well, there's some guy who's mining, mining sand to turn into silicon. They have a sales process. They, yep. sell to, they sell to a fabrication company. That fabrication company then uses that raw material to create a product. That product then gets sold to a manufacturer, a PC manufacturer. That PC ma or the chip manufacturer or wherever we are in the step gets the chip manufacturer, the chip manufacturer, or the, the PC manufacturer, sells it to a distributor, sells it to a reseller, sells it to us. At each point in that chain, there was a sale. Now, what you consider to be a supply chain from a manufacturing perspective, you're absolutely right, is that you're, you can absolutely define that as a supply chain. But for me, as I'm looking at sales strategies and I'm looking at how do we get product to market, each, at each stage, a dollar passed hands. Yep. So therefore it was flowing through a channel and you can trace every product back to its natural material. Okay. So I'm going to define a channel as one of those pieces. And, and so if you think about the supply chain going from sand to computer, there was mm -hmm. 
a channel to get sand to the semi to, to actually to the to the silicon manufacturer. And then there's a channel to get the silicon to the um, semiconductor manufacturer. And then there's a yep. channel to get the semiconductor to the computer manufacturer. Right? And, and so that helps me think about it because now I only have to worry about the profitability of one company at a time. Right. right. Who's, and, who's the customer I'm dealing with? Right. So whenever you're talking about, and, and, and keep in mind, there's a lot of, at least in my, in my orbit, a lot of people wanted to find a channel as having a two-tier relation, a, a one-tier or two-tier relationship. Either you're going through a reseller or you're going through some level of distribution to reseller to customer. To me, a channel is a sales motion. And that can include direct relationships. It can include automated relationships. Yeah, so it's not the it's not the what that's doing it, it's the how it's being done. It's very simple for me, is that when I look at the you know the relationships within channels. The question I'm asking is, what's the relationship? Is it sell to, sell through, sell with? Are you referring? Are you automating? I don't care what you call yourself. I just want to know how you're structuring the process. Yes. And, and in today's world, we're probably doing multiple of those at once. Probably. Yeah, we are ultimately. And it, to me is that um, hmm, we're toying with some new ideas around this about, you know, you know, Yes, it, nobody would actually call it this, but there are such things as parallel channels. So if you take companies that we support, you know, we work with companies like HP, Cisco, uh, Microsoft, and so forth. Um, they have different types of channels to meet different types of needs. Yep. What what we look at when when somebody comes to us looking for a channel strategy, the first thing we want to know is who's the customer. And what is it yep. that you need to, what does the customer need from you? Or what does the customer need to be successful with your product? And that will then define the chain or the channel that it goes through. Okay, this is starting to make a lot of sense to me. Um, so let's pretend for a second that we're going to sell through a secondary channel, whether it's a distributor or a rep firm, I don't really care, right? Yeah. We're going to sell through a channel and we need to get the product to an end buyer. When you think about pricing, which I do all the time, do you have a method that you teach people on how to price or would you just like to judge my method on what I teach people how to price through that? You know, this, this is the reason why I've been looking forward to this conversation because it is a huge debate in channel circles or, or actually around channel circles. What I mean by around is that channel people are overlooked and underappreciated because sales organizations say they need their channel partners, but then they want to take credit for it all. And nobody wants to pay the overhead of supporting a channel, even though channel sales have proven time and again to be less expensive and more profitable to support than a direct sale. However, when we start talking about pricing strategies, the the technology market where we are primarily specialized in is going through, and it's, and I have to, I have to say that I would, I think that at some point over the next de decade, the rest of uh, the market will fall in this direction is going to services. So it's not that you're differentiating between what is a product and what is a service is that we're selling products as a service. And some people listening in may have heard this term, everything as a service. So yep. that's to sell everything on subscriptions. Well, it's an interesting case because the, the channel typically operates not on pricing per, so much as discounting or margins. So what they'll say is, is that we will discount, we will give you, the partner, a margin, a share of the margin. So call it 10%. And then they'll go through their, disc, you know, their discounting process. So we go from street to you know, the difference between street floor and, price, uh, and strike price. So it doesn't matter because the partner is going to receive that 10% no matter where they end up in the discounting. The problem with services is particularly in when I say I worry about what the sales motion is, the difference in, in when, when you deal with the channel, the channel's pricing is independent of yours. So you can say that you're setting the price, the street price is $100 and you're going to give the partner 10, 20% of that. But the partner can't live on 10 or 20%. They have to come in and add something to that. So they're going to do their own markup on top of it. 
And so the challenge that a lot of companies do going in the services now is understanding what is the appropriate markup or what is an acceptable markup on top of the services or whatever they're enabling the service to be sold as. Yeah, and so, what so go ahead. I was gonna say, let's not, let's not bring in services yet because I want to get to the pricing mechanism and then we're going to confuse the heck out of it when we bring in everything as a service because that to me is much more challenging to think through how do I sell it on a channel. Right. So if I'm going to sell a part, I don't care what it is, I'm going to sell a tractor through a dealer, right? I've, I've got a thing that I'm trying to sell here. The way I think about pricing this, if someone were to ask me, well, how do I price this through the channel? I would always say, well, what's the end customer willing to pay for the product? So let's go out to the farmer who's thinking about buying a tractor. How much do I think it's worth to him? If I'm selling John Deere, uh, what's the Kubota price? And are we better and how much better? And so I'm looking at that end user price. And then I'm stepping back and saying, okay, how much do I have to pay my channel, my distributor, my dealer, in order to motivate him to sell my product? And I think of that just like a price, right? I'm paying him to go do something for me. And that payment could be a 10% margin, a 20% margin, whatever it is. And we mm -hmm. often think of that as a margin number, as a percentage, not as a right. dollar value. But it's really just, okay, just like I want to sell to an end customer, I have to know this dealer could be selling my tractor, it could be selling somebody else's tractor. How much do I have to pay him to motivate him to do a good job selling my, my products? That's a, that's a very monolithic way of looking at it. Um, and that's often a mistake that's made when dealing with channel strategies, thinking about this as what do I have to pay versus what do I have to do to enable or what do I have to do to engage with a partner to be a good go-to-market, have a good go-to-market relationship. Okay, and, so, so, so I, got, I got to step back because there's nothing different between what I said and let's pretend I'm going to just price a product out in the marketplace. And you could say, well, the price is just kind of a monolithic. That's just the number. What you really want to be asking is, how can I add more value to my customer so they're willing to pay me more money? And, and absolutely, that's an absolutely true statement. And I oh, think no, of the channel no, partner as the same thing. No, 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 no. Uh, and we may, be, we may be talking past each other, um, but a lot of the equation has to go into, you may be surrendering 20 points to a partner. But how much more can the partner add on independent of you because of that sale? What is the what is the economic opportunity that is being created as a result of that product going in? They may not make a whole lot of money. If they're making $20 on a $100 sale, they have to do five times the sales as you to make the same money. So the real equation in this is how do you, you know, at least this is the way we look at it, is how do we define the total economic opportunity associated with that one sale? So if a customer spends a dollar with you on this product, you know, so, you know, pricing impact, I'm going to resell you and the customer is going to spend a dollar. How many more dollars will they spend with the partner as a result of that sale? That's the calculus that we go through to determine channel profitability and the economic equation. So many times, and it can be as, you know, we've seen numbers ranging from seven to one to 19 to one. Yeah, so, so I actually love this conversation. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> no, 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 so, no, please. So, so the way I think about it, in, the way I try to describe what you just said to me yep. is let's say that I have a product that uh, you're going to sell a ton of accessories around my product. Then you would likely be willing to sell my product at a much tinier margin than some competitor who doesn't have as many options, who doesn't have as many upsells. You're not going to sell more things. And so to me, it's, it's all about what does it take for that channel partner to make more money, convince them that, that selling my product is a better decision than selling my competitors' products? Maybe. So the caveat on that is, is that do you have the brand presence to be able to have that, that kind of leverage? Yep. So better known brands market leaders can afford to have skinnier margins going to going to their partners because they have higher consideration and purchasing rates amongst their customers now if you look at it from a startup <clears throat> perspective that's trying to build market share or build presence maybe they are going to spend more on the margin so that they can to you know to control partners into selling them more or taking a risk by selling them so it is very contextual in the way that you set these these levels 
Yeah, I, I agree 100%, right? It's it, just like if I had a good brand, I could charge a higher price to an end customer. If I have a good brand, I can probably get away with, look, we could call it charging a higher price to my dealer, but we could also call it just get it, squeezing the margin because mm -hmm. of the brand image I have. Correct. Um, or brand yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call it squeezing the margin. I think it's a matter of equity. And sure. again, again, if you can say, you know, if you have a market leading brand with market leading products that are in high demand, maybe you can go shallower on the margin, but it's mostly because you can then also justify that by saying how much more they're going to be able to do in the tax sales. That's Absolutely. The, right. That's the logic. That's the logic behind it. Absolutely. And, and it may not even be attached sales. It may just be, look, people are going to call you and ask to buy my product where you have to go physically sell somebody else's product. And yeah, and so, I mean, right? nobody, hey, look, nobody ever, got, well, it's the old saying, nobody ever got fired, you know, for buying IBM. You know, yep. it's because, you know, the, it, was a, it was a safe purchase. Uh, and as a result of that, the IBM partners, I mean, it's not so much like this today. There's a lot more competition, but back in the day, IBM partners were very comfortable because they knew they had first mover advantage in terms of consideration. Okay, awesome. This has been fabulous so far. Now, when we were on the Model N meeting, I asked you a yeah. question at the end and you didn't answer it. So let's work our way towards getting to that, to that question. Okay. So first off, let's talk about selling services through a channel. So by services, we're going to talk about SaaS or XaaS or you know whatever it is. But let's think of it as a as a subscription type product where you're going to have a monthly or annual payment for a product. Okay. First off, do you have any general comments about what does that look like? How is it different than selling a tractor through a channel? Oh, it's vastly different and exactly the same. So a lot of the same considerations that go into it are still the same. You still have to provide knowledge exchange and skills enablement. You still have to provide marketing support, marketing materials. And then you can start talking about how do you, you know, how do you plot, you know, how do you prime the engine with incentives, either front or back end incentives, right? Um, the difference is, is because, you know, that this is where those cloud vendors or those services companies have to make choices around what they want to do with the partner or what's the partner's expectation. So again, come back to what's the sales motion? Is it sell to or sell with or sell through? Because if it's sell to, then the reseller or the partner, which we call managed service providers, they are the ones who are actually branding and delivering the service. So they are the end customer to the, the cloud company. And then they are going to create a service independently and then sell that down to their customer. If it's sell with, and you know, if it's sell with, then there is some level of collaboration between the two companies. And if it's sell through, it's a reseller motion where they're just passing paper. So the partner in this instance will just create the contract and they may have some lingering service or administrative role that goes on to start supporting the customer. It's the choice though, and this is what I mean by the cho choice that has to be made is that do you want to cut the partner into the recurring revenue? Or do you want to pay the partner for the total contract for some percentage of the total contract value and then let them move on to the next customer? And that is a bit of tension that's going on, at least in the services world, is which one should it be? Because if you have them on the you know, as a share of the recurring revenue, well, there's mind you, let's let's set aside the entire, you know, acclimating to that model and building that recurring revenue stream. But now you're paying the partner in perpetuity for something that happened once, or at least perceivably happened once. Yep. But if you do a transactional model where you pay them on the, on the TCV and they get paid once and they're largely disengaged, then do you, do you run the chance of losing the partner or the customer? So that's where we, that's why I say we have to make choices in terms of which model we choose and how do we, how do we set compensation? And then on top of all that is that there's differences between this, how they gets price. So in the sell to model, the partner sets the price in the sell through sell with model, the part, you know, the partner and the supplier or the, the cloud company will mutually set a price. And what we see happening is, is that I'm starting to say this earlier in the sell to model, I may sell it to you for, I may say the list or the street price is hundred dollars. I may sell it to you for 80. Mm -hmm. And then I see you go out and charge $200, $250 for it. And I look at it and I go, oh my God, I left money on the table. No, you didn't leave money on the yeah. table. Is that the partner is the one who's out there, you know, 
raising, you know, they had to mark up the price because they're the ones carrying a heavier load. Right. You know, but yeah, we have, we have this conversation often. And without a doubt, the partner in the sell two model that you just described, without a doubt, that partner is adding value uh, somehow. And that's how they're able to get away with that $250 price point or whatever yep. it happens to be. So um, I, I'm not so worried about the sell to people because I, I think of that as a VAR, right? So I've got a value added reseller. I'm going to sell them something. They're going to put value on top of that and resell it at some some other point. And, and that just seems normal to me as in normal business. But the sell through or sell with model, I think that's where it gets really, really hard. Because as you said, I used to get, you know, when I sold a tractor, I hope you don't mind, I keep bringing up tractors, right? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm beginning to get an impression. Yeah. <laughs> when I sold a tractor before, I may have sold it for, let's say, $50,000, and my dealer was getting 10000 off of that. And that's a big chunk of change. But what if I'm able to, instead of selling a tractor, sell a subscription to a tractor? Mm -hmm. Right, sell the ability that you can use it, but you don't really own it. And you know, as long as you're using it, we're going to charge you based on how much of your field you plow, or how many minutes it's running, or whatever it happens to be. So now, how do I compensate my channel with that? Mm. Well, look, I think you have it backwards. In the sell two model, it's not a var model um, because the the partner in that scenario is the end customer. And in order for you as the manufacturer or the supplier of that service or whatever is enabling that service, in order for you to grow, you are dependent on that partner growing their business. So they have to continually consume that product in order for you to make more money. As opposed to what you're describing in a sell through or sell with is that there may be a partner involved in, deal, in, in that resale of a product or a service, but you are the one who has more control over the pricing and over the terms. And how do you make money on this in terms of, you know, how do you compensate the partner? How do you make money on a sell through, sell with on what you're describing that's more consumption based? It's a really good question. If you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> Wait, that's the whole reason I invited you on the podcast, Larry. Come on. <laughs> no, look, there's the, look, the truth is, is that it's, it's relatively simple, is that then you're looking at the TCV. So the total contract value should be able to inform the compensation. That's what I'm saying is that in those models, we tend to recommend more transactional or more, more one-time compensation for the partner involved to say, okay, it's like you sign a 12-month contract. It's a thousand dollars. We're going to give you 10% of it. Here's a hundred dollars now or 20, 20% or two months or whatever it is and give it to you and off you go. The problem you're describing though is going forward is today we are on subscription. Subscription and, and consumption are two different models. So with subscription, I'm paying a recurring fee for, you know, for a la carte. I get is, you know, the buffet, the buffet meal out there in Reno is that, I can eat as much as I want or as little as I want. It's entirely up to me, but the price remains the same. On consumption, I don't know what the total contract value is until the contract is over. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, that's actually true with subscription as well. Because even if you paid me the exact same amount month after month after month, I, I know what you signed up for in terms of the contract, but you're going to stay with me for the next 20 years. And so the actual lifetime value of that customer is much, much bigger than the one-year contract that, that they signed in the beginning. Oh, without a doubt. I'm not going to diminish the, 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 the total lifetime value of a, of a relationship. What I mean by it is, though, is that in the subscription model, you know what you're going to get. There is, there is a high degree of certainty of the amount of money you're going to get from month to month to year to year. Yep. And consumption-based, you know, it's like electricity. My electric bill is never the same twice. Yep. But my internet service is exactly the same. So that's what I mean in terms of the variableness and the unpredictability between those two models. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I could see how that confuses the channel a little bit if we're going to sell them based on a contract. So did you sign the two-year contract? Yes. Okay, we'll give you this much. Uh, well, when the, look, look, when, it, when we first started selling services, it truly was month to month. Sign up go, you know, we'll, we'll charge you month to month. And for the customer, that was decreased risk. 
you know, if I don't like this, I can back out of it. Well, what do we have now? If you, you know, you can still go on to any SaaS uh, provider and buy month to month. But if you sign up for the year, they're going to give you 20 points. Why? Because they know they want to lock you in for the year. They want that level of certainty. And you're right, the renewal rates, well, renewal rates are an interesting conversation onto, their, onto themselves. Uh, we say, you know, if you're, if you're not renewing at 90%, then you got problems. I, I think that's pretty reasonable for, for a lot of businesses. Yes. That, that makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay, Larry, this has just been fabulous. I've, I've loved this conversation, uh, but we're going to have to wrap this up. And now I'm going to ask you a real pricing question. Okay. It's What's too one? Much. I know exactly. What's one piece <laughs> of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Pricing advice for your, your listeners. You know, again, I'm a channel guy, so take this for because I, I deal with how pricing affects the uh, the, ch- the value chain, the market, and you to me is that this is about setting a price that matches what the market what the market is willing to pay and and a place where you can afford to uh to work with intermediaries and we've actually created a uh i, I wouldn't go as far as to call it a model but more of an ex, a primer an explanation on this is that once you fall out of that zone where there's not enough not enough endemic margin in your pricing to support yourself plus your partners then stop selling to your partners Makes a lot of sense. Right? Makes a yep. lot of sense. All right. Um, Larry, you know what I didn't ask you today? Could you give me 30 seconds? What does Channelnomics do? Uh, we do a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> Simply put, we're a, re- we're a research and strategy firm. We help uh, technology and manufacturing companies around the world identify and plan, and stra- plan strategize, uh, and understand indirect routes to market. So we work... We work in every region, um, you know, 100, I think we've touched 103 countries. Um, and our entire days in and out are just really plying better routes to market for our clients. Yeah. And I got to tell you, channels really are confusing. I mean, there's so much <laughs> going on in channels. So, yeah. Nice. Hey, uh, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, look, reach out to me directly. I'm really easy to get to LM Walsh at channelnomics.com or just hit our website, channelnomics.com, and we'll get you the right person to talk to. All right. Thank you. Episode 124 is all done. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? Um, Apple Podcasts would be phenomenal. And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.